It's time for Declare Your Independence with Ernest Hancock. Believe me when I say we have a difficult time ahead of us. But if we are to be prepared for it, we must first shed our fear of it. I stand here without fear because I remember. I remember that I am here not because of the path that lies before me, but because of the path that lies behind me. I remember that for 100 years we have fought these machines. And after a century of war, I remember that which matters most. We are still here! No fear, no fear, no fear here on Declare Your Independence with me, Ernest Hancock, each and every day here in Phoenix, Arizona. Hey, from the beautiful studios of Freedoms of the Nest, freedomsphoenix.com on lrn.fm network. And we have on special guest, Bill Fletcher. Now, Bill Fletcher is uh, going to talk to us about the attack on unions. Now, he is co-founder of the Center for Labor, Labor Renewal, author of Solidary Dividend, Solidarity Dividend, The Crisis in Organized Labor and a New Path Toward Social Justice. He also wrote a piece, uh, Modern Day Pirates, the Republicans versus the Public Sector. So you can see where we're going with this. Now, his website, blackcommentator.com, blackcommentator.com. Now, Bill, this is a, we're going to start off with an understanding where I'm coming from, and then we'll get you all in. You ready? Go for it. I am a hardcore, no compromise, anarchist, libertarian, man. I'm just like everybody, each individual is free to contract and do whatever they want. You can collect a bargain all you want. You can have what. But when you get the government involved, especially where they say an employer, the job is his. Okay, I, I own this job. I created the, the, the job. Now, the labor belongs to the individual. They can withhold that all they want. They can withhold it with their friends all they want. But for the government to force me to have to contract or deal with them, then you start going, you know, uh, you know, out on the edge there. You know, it's hard to make a rational argument for that. But what I need from you is an understanding from your perspective of what's going on with all of the, from your perspective, I would imagine the union busting efforts and give me an idea of what the battle really is and the advocacy from your side. Go ahead. The battle is about the super wealthy, which is why I wouldn't agree with your premise, with all due respect. Uh, but I, I hear what you're saying. Well, go, go ahead and tell me what you disagree with so we can understand what we're talking it's, about. It's not, there's no equivalence between someone, quote unquote, owning a job and someone selling their labor power. There's not the supposed people, to be an qu- equivalence, it's just property. Well, that's part of the problem, and that there is no equal power. So it, it's, it's a false, um, there's this illusion of actual freedom. I mean, what we have in this country is a super wealthy elite uh, that is um, with, with a wealth polarization greater than any time since 1929. Why do you think that it's, is? Because of the economic policies that have been followed since uh, the mid-1970s. Such as that what? Had, um, privatization, attacks on unions, destroying uh, the right to collectively bargain. The right to collectively bargain proved to be, it's, it, it's factually been the most effective anti-poverty program this country ever saw in terms of raising the living standard of millions of working people. Well, it's about to and go the other way here real quick. That's the problem. When we, when we are losing the right to collectively bargain, it furthers the polarization of wealth. And that's what we've been seeing. When it becomes harder and harder for workers to stand together and to bargain with their employer, then it becomes a tyranny of the employer. Okay, how is it harder... For someone to bargain their labor, is it because the employer's not forced to bargain with them? I mean, is that, is that what you're right. advocating? The, 
the employer the employers engage in a variety of shenanigans. Oh man, I can give you all kinds of you know stuff the SEIC has done to employers that I know of. I mean, we can go back and forth. Oh, no, on... no, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't compare. Um, when when the employer fires people, it's it's called in the in in fact that when you look at labor relations law, they talk about terminations as being the capital punishment of employment relationships. And the problem is that the way that the law works now since it has not kept up with the changes in um, technology, the changes in the workforce, the way the work is organized, is that increasingly what an employer can do, it, it, it ends up being in their interest to break the National Labor Relations Act, to fire workers as a form of intimidation. And this is what's been happening. Well, for you, it's been made to be in their best interest. Let me, let me give you a... Um, I'm I'm been a libertarian candidate for you know Congress and Senate and state and all this kind of stuff, and you always get invited to go speak to the unions. Now, after years of this, twenty something years of me being a libertarian advocate and activist, I I get to know these people. I see them at different. They know what my rhetoric is. It's going to be the same this two years as it was two years before, and then the next two years later, it's going to be the same. And my thing is, I'm like, you know, I. We're libertarian philosophy. We're like uh, labor's best friends. We're going, of course you own your labor. Of course you get to do what you want with it. Of course you can collectively bargain. Of course you can, you know, band with others in a unit. Of course. But you're not going to get us to advocate for a gun to the employer's head that he has to contract with you. And I'm, and you're saying, well, no, you have to because... And I'm, I'm trying to understand why, because there's an inequity between the wealthy person or not so wealthy that created a job or a business or a company. And I'm wondering right. when it goes from one employee to 5,000 in there somewhere, there's some kind of force and we've got, we got to pass a law that at some point they got to collectively bargain. And I'm going, who decides that? And how's that decided? The workers, the workers according to the law, I mean, this is what's really interesting. You're confusing me and, with and someone that way, cares about the law. No, 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 listen. I, first of all, I, I didn't say in the beginning I very much appreciated being invited to be on your program. No, no, no we're going to so, have a good time. We're so, going to get it all out. So the thing, the way that the law works is that workers have a right to collectively bargain. Of course that's they do. The, that's the law. Absolutely. Right? And so, Knock yourself out. Okay, so what that means is that if the workers at a particular workplace do not want to be involved in a union, they don't have to be. Okay. But here's the punchline. The problem is that the employers can interfere with the workers' right to choose whether to bargain. So in other words, the workers can join a union, but an employer can, te- can engage in activities that intimidate the workers. One of the examples is I mentioned before is firing, but you only have to get that far. There's something called captive audience meetings where the employer can sit down with a worker by themselves and basically browbeat that worker. You're, you're, to the you're point. missing. No, I understand, Bill. It could be 15 gazillion different ways that they do it. But I, I, I want to. There's you know, nothing I, comparable me, that a union can do. So. See, and the thing, and, what? No, there's, nothing, <sighs> there's nothing comparable that a union could do. Because it's not that, their job. It belongs to the employer. It's no, my property. It's, I can do whatever the heck I want with it. But it's the, it's the question of whether or not you believe that there is a fundamental right, a freedom of association, and a right to collectively bargain. So if basically no, what you're saying... No, there is. You, you can collectively bargain all you want. I don't have to collectively bargain with you. So you're saying there, there is no right not to bargain with you. I have to. And I'm going, you, if, if that's you freedom? You have to if there's a majority of the workforce... That votes for it, yeah. So that means the majority of the workforce owns my job that I created. No, it doesn't. It uh, means heck it that doesn't. they have a right. <laughs> no, they don't own the job. They have a right to collectively bargain. Look at the law. You can bargain the all you want, say- but I don't have to bargain with you. That's correct. Well, that's what we're trying to get to. But when we no, come back, we're going to hit that button on us here in just a little bit, Bill. So hold on a moment. We'll get to it. Everybody gets to express themselves on the show and get the whole spiel. Because I'm, I'm for collective bargain. I mean, you want to collectively bargain. You want to join a union. You want. To, I don't care. The thing is, is that if I have to deal with you or contract with you, then it's not really my job. I didn't create it. It's like my business got taken over by the union. 
the heck is Cream of the Night? 